power of data and partnerships. Uh, my name is Dom Haslam. I'm the chair of the International Disability and Development Consortium, uh, which is a member of the GLAD network. We have an excellent range of speakers for you and panelists, and I'd like to thank each of them in advance for their contributions to the discussion today. I'll introduce each of them as we go along. Uh, please do share any questions that occur as we go through the session in the Q&A section or the chat box, and I'll do all I can to ensure uh, that we have some time to tackle those at the end of the session. The key questions we're looking to speakers to address are, what will disability inclusive development look like after the pandemic? How can stakeholders across all sectors use the power of data and partnership to build back better? And what kind of cooperation and partnerships exist? What kinds of cooperation should be built to promote the use of disability disaggregated data? And what good practices are there in inclusive development currently? Uh, personally, I'm a bit of a data geek um, and I've really seen the difference that good quality data on the realities of the exclusion faced by persons with disabilities can have, both in policy discussions and debate, but also in the practical implementation of inclusion focused development programs. So I'm really looking forward to this session. I hope you are too. Without further ado, I'd like to turn to our two keynote speakers. So firstly, I'd like to invite Borg Vega Soliel, the Director General of the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, or NORAD. Borg has held a number of government offices, including Minister of Education and Minister of the Environment, as well as being a member of the Norwegian Parliament and Secretary General of the World Wildlife Fund in Norway. Borg, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I love data, I love statistics, uh, but unlike Dominic, I'm not, a, I'm not a numbers geek or a data geek. It's because I'm a people geek, and numbers are uh, extremely important to understand people's situation and to actually do something about it. Firstly, data can tell us something about the situation we are facing and the situation people are facing. What is needed, by whom, and where. And secondly, um, data can tell us what works and what doesn't. Did a project actually uh, make uh, uh, or do something for inclusion, or did it not? Without data, we won't know. And thirdly, uh, data is needed to hold duty bearers accountable. Governments, uh, service providers, donors, and it can be used from, for civil society uh, and, uh, uh, or journalists or others to actually hold them accountable. So without timely and high quality data, it's really difficult to, to uh, work with social and economic progress. Um, the consequences of the ongoing pandemic has highlighted the need for regular data collection on the experiences of people with disabilities. In a crisis like the one we are in currently, up-to-date data uh, uh, on how people are actually doing is crucial. And I would like to add that we are also, it's also extremely important to talk about disaggregated data specifically. That is data where we actually understand how different groups are doing. And I think it's fair to say that the sustainable development goals and, and more specifically the leave no one behind approach has been vital in making us understand that much better. And, and uh, of course, for, for people with disabilities it, or for other vulnerable groups, I think it's especially key that we have good data on a disaggregate level. Um, in our Norwegian development cooperation, we are working with lots of different issues with different partners. But one of the things that we have chosen to do is to quite, do quite a lot of work with capacity building, also uh, on, on data uh, specifically. 
we are working with uh, the use of administrative, including digital data for production of statistics. Uh, we have a lot of experience, or, or Statistics Bureau have a lot of experience with working with registers, uh, basic public registers, and we share our experiences with partner countries. Uh, and like an increasing number of partners, Norway support the development and use of the Washington Group on Disability Statistics tool. The use of tested data collection tools is part uh, of the Global Disability Summit commitments that Norway is committed to, committed to in 2018. Let me also uh, mention uh, one or two more uh, examples. Uh, first, we are collaborating with the Organization for People with Disabilities uh, and communities of practice have mobilized to source current data and insights. A great example is the COVID-19 disability rights monitor. The way the community has mobilized to provide, provide pertinent data amidst the pandemic shows the importance of OPD networks and the potential, of course, of crowdsourced data as well. Um, this year, Norway has entered ambit an ambitious disability partnership with UNICEF, where one of the aims is to strengthen UNICEF's efforts to collect and report disability disaggregated data across their areas of work. Uh, and this is uh, 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 one of the many ways that we also partnering with uh, others. Uh, let me, let me uh, end by, um, by addressing uh, also an approach that I find uh, specific uh, or, or really important. And that is that uh, the work we do with disability inclusion it has to be uh, a major uh, effort, not something we do on the fringes or in the mar on the margins of what we do uh, uh, as a donor. Uh, we do we do quite a few programs specifically aimed at uh, disability work, but we are also trying to mainstream it into our major efforts on education of other issues, and I think also. You know, it's, it's a way of thinking that's Im important. It is being a person with a disability is common around the world. And it has to be some, you know, a part of the core work, not on the fringes. And for this data and statistics are important, uh, relevant and reliable facts are key to planning and to decision making and to understanding how many people it actually uh, 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 affects. So um, as we seek to build back better, making sure data is available, also disaggregated data uh, by disability will allow us to better consider and fulfill the rights of people with disabilities. So um, uh, I look forward to, uh, to also listening to the rest of the event now and hearing the inputs from you. And, and again, thank you for the chance to address this really important and pertin pertinent issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Board. And uh, I think your point about how the pandemic has highlighted the need for disaggregated data and, and how central that will be to achieving the sustainable development goals really, really resonated with me. Thank you for that. Um, next, I'd like to move to Penny Innes, who's head of the Disability Inclusion Team of the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO, and also co-chair of the GLAD Network. Penny led the team which organized the Global Disability Summit in 2018 alongside the International Disability Alliance and the government of Kenya. Penny, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dom, and um, thank you for the invitation to this um, eminent panel, so I'm, I'm very honored. Um, and as Dom said, I'm speaking to you today from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, and I used to be work for the Department for International Development in the UK, but that was combined with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in September to become the, um, the FCDO or the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And I'm the head of the disability inclusion team there. And the creation of FCDO provides us with a really great opportunity actually to work with more partners and across a wider stage. It's a much bigger department and so it enables my team to influence 
um, a, a lot more teams and people and, and issues. So um, there's plenty of opportunity for us ahead. Um, and next year, in fact, um, we've just announced that next year we're going to be refreshing our disability inclusion strategy and making it fit for purpose for the new organisation, um, which will also allow us to look at some, some new issues like the response from COVID-19 and climate and environment as well. And I just, um, before uh, saying a, a few words about data and partnerships, I just wanted to mention um, that we recently published a progress paper against our strategy, which sets out the achievements that we've, we've um, been able to make over the last couple of years since we published the strategy. And I'm, I'm really proud of all the things that uh, set out in that report. Um, just two examples, we're supporting over 100,000 girls with disabilities in school and learning. Um, and that's part of our Girls Education Challenge, um, which has really used the Washington group questions in all of the different projects that are um, within, within that bigger program. And so collection of disaggregated data and um, identifying girls with disabilities has been a really key part of that. And the other example, I'll just highlight is uh, the fantastic work on assistive technology, which are programs 80, 20, 30, and at scale um, are delivering. And of course, we're partnered, partnering with Norway on at scale. And just week, this week, they launched a fantastic investment case for assistive technology, which sets out the return on investment. And, and again, data is a really critical part of that, that initiative as well. Um, and just as we're talking about partnerships, the range of achievements that, that we've been able to make have only been possible through partnerships with uh, the wonderful people and organisations that we work with. So Sightsavers and Leonard Cheshire leading two big programme consortia. We work with the International Disability Alliance, uh, the Disability Rights Fund, the UN Partnership on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and all the members of the Global Action on Disability Donor and foundation network. So just um, it just, just brought to mind of all the, the great partnerships that are underway that, that help us to make, make the progress. And we're proud to work with all of you. So I was thinking through what are the ingredients for success, successful partnership. Um, and, and I was thinking about the global, the GLAD network, the Global Action on Disability Network, and um, why that works so well. And I say there are three things in particular. First is shared goals. We have a shared ambition. We want to international development to be truly disability inclusive. Um, we also are open to new ideas and to listening to each other and learning from each other, which is really important. And then thirdly, because of that, we um, have built up trust, which I think is really important for all successful partnerships. And it's actually amazing to think that um, it was earlier this year that we all met as the GLAD network in Washington in February, it seems so long ago. Um, and it's a shame that we, we haven't been able to meet um, this year, but um, we are able to meet virtually and we're still able to learn, to share ideas and, and make relationships. And through GLAD, we have really achieved a lot in the last few years from the Global Disability Summit in 2018 to the high level meeting um, on the COVID-19 response earlier this year. And I was just going to take one example from GLAD's work, which combines both of the themes of today's meeting, which is the OECD DAC spend marker. We worked together to encourage the OECD Development Assistance Committee's working party on statistics to introduce the disability inclusive spend marker and we were successful in this by, by influencing, by negotiation, by working together. That was agreed in 2018 and the marker was introduced on a voluntary basis. Um, and many donors are now measuring and reporting against their spend. Around 30%, I believe, of ODA is assessed against it. And the data was released for the first time in February of this year. And though it's not complete, it is a big step forward um, because Capturing and reporting data on spend is, is so important. It gives us a baseline, it gives us information that we can use to improve and, to, and for advocacy as well. And it is one of GLAD's concrete um, achievements. 
And I think we can use this collaborative approach of working together to influence key opportunities coming up, like at the COP26 climate change conference, which is taking place in, in a year's time in Glasgow. So it's a really big opportunity for us to make sure that that event is, is disability inclusive. And of course, to work together to support uh, Ida and the Norway Norwegian government to make the Norway summit a really massive success. And um, of course, in the time of COVID-19, as, as others have said, data is even more important. And we know that the, the pandemic has a disproportionate impact on people with disabilities. And we must gather the data that, that demonstrates that. So we have that evidence to build on and also the evidence on what works best to respond effectively. So using every opportunity to push for data to be disaggregated, I completely agree about that. And, and also the use of the Washington Group questions, which is such a, such a useful and versatile tool to be included in surveys. And so finally, we know that resources will be tight as a consequence of the global economic downturn. And we know we have an enormous challenge ahead to help to achieve our vision of all people with disabilities being engaged and able to exercise their rights and be included in, dis in um, international development. But we can make the most of the funding that is available and we can change attitudes towards disability. And we can also make sure that people with disabilities are able to participate and advocate for their rights. And by gathering data, uh, we, we know more about their needs and can make sure that our programming is um, better qual quality and, and better um, aligned to needs. So we must work together, can continue to work together in partnership with high ambition, listening and learning from each other. And that way we will achieve our goal. Thank you. Back to you, Don. Thanks very much, Penny. And um, yeah, great to hear about the plans to review the FCBO's disability inclusion strategy. Um, we heard from the UK Minister uh, just on a uh, on the plenary call just uh, just before this call. So that was that was good as well as the work being done by the department to collect and analyse disability inclusive data. Um, so thanks very much for that. I'll, I'm now going to turn to our five panellists um, so that you hear more from them than from me. I'll introduce the entire panel now if that's okay and then ask each to speak in turn before we open the floor for the questions that I'm hoping you'll be able to submit in the chat box or the Q&A. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Jose Vieira, who's the main representative of the stakeholder group of persons with disabilities and also CEO of the World Blind Union. Jose has been a key disability rights activist for many years, including being the director of the Latin America Regional Center for Disability Rights Promotion. Jose will discuss the importance and uh, uh, the advances made in data collection and disaggregation by persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. After Jose, we'll hear from Claudia Kappa, who is the Senior Advisor on Statistics and Monitoring at UNICEF, with a particular focus on early childhood development, child disability and child protection. Ms. Kappa has previously worked at the International Labour Organization and will be presenting a new publication by UNICEF, which uses data to illustrate the vulnerabilities that put children with disabilities at increased risk during the pandemic. And then we'll hear from teacher Farah Chisaka, who's the program manager for the Inclusive Data Charter at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Teacher Farah has worked for over 14 years in the development sector, including at Plan International, the Overseas Development Institute and BBC Media Action. And Teacher Farah will be speaking about the importance of building capacity to collect data and how partnerships can help us to get there. Uh, then we'll have Alberto Vasquez, who is the research coordinator of the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina Devandas, that many of us will know. Uh, Alberto is a human rights lawyer and is also president of the NGO Society and Disability. Mr. Vasquez will uh, present the conclusions and the recommendations from Mr. Vandas's last report as UN Special Rapporteur. Uh, which was focused around development assistance. And finally, but not 
least, Susan Scott Parker, who's the CEO of Business Disability International. Uh, Susan's also the strategic advisor to the ILO's Global Disability Network and also GIZ, and founded the world's first business disability network. Susan will speak uh, about working with business leaders as valuable allies and potential partners to enable disability inclusive development. So I hope you agree it's a, it's a wide ranging panel with a huge range of expertise. And now that everybody's introduced, um, over to you please to start us off, Jose. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, I just want to make sure that you are hearing me well, Dom. Loud and clear, Jose. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I was just having a little bit of a problem here with my internet connection. So thank you, Dominic, for the um, for the for for being part of the for allowing me to be part of this of this panel. Uh, very quickly, um, I think one of the first times that um, it came out uh, from from the two keynote speakers, and I really want to um, take it for my short presentation here, is um, where we are at in terms of of daytime partnership. And from an OPD perspective, I think um, it's clear that we have pretty much all realized how important data is for persons with disabilities and um, how data can be one of the best tools to monitor the implementation of the UNCRPD convention, the SDGs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in the context of, of any accountability framework, as well as to um, quickly shift our strategy to an evidence-based um, approach when uh, promoting the right of people with disabilities. Data, it's a clear component and it's a very uh, important and relevant uh, component for persons with disabilities and their representative organization. At the same time, I would say that um, we have also realized that there has been a lot of investment at the international level, at the global level, from different organizations, uh, UN agencies, uh, international non-governmental organizations, governments around the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the best example of that is the Global Disability Summit and the commitments around data that came out from the Global Disability Summit in 2018. Um, on, the, on, on how persons with disabilities and their representative organizations can contribute to this discussion and how we can actually benefit from an increasive, increasing world of data and, and the different roles that different actors can play. However, I would say that if we want to look into the future um, and, and keeping in mind that one of the biggest challenge we still have ahead of us is how we can translate these great global achievements and, uh, and excellent commitments at the national level and how we want to transfer uh, these great discussions that we have at the international level um, to the real um, change that our people with disabilities are, ex are, are expecting from us to lead on, I would say that we need more and more engagement and partnership between organizations of persons with disabilities and um, other type of, of entities working in the field of, of data. And for that to happen, I would highlight that at least there are three main pillars that Jose, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I think we've lost you briefly. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we um, we come back to Jose. Um, I think we have a good starting point when he rejoined us around the three pillars. Um, so I'd like to move on to uh, Claudia. Claudia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, Dominique, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to start my intervention by thanking the organizer for giving me the opportunity to speak at this event today. And as Dominique mentioned in my intervention, I will convey some of the key messages that are included in a publication on children with disability and COVID-19 that will be uh, released tomorrow on the occasion of the International Day of Persons with, uh, with Disabilities. The publication uses existing data, so pre-COVID data, as well as data that have been collected uh, in the last few months to illustrate the vulnerability that place children with disability at higher risk 
during the current pandemic. It also documents what has happened to services for children and adults with disability across the world and include examples of what has been done by governments and, and different stakeholders to address disruption in services. Finally, the publication considered the challenges but also the opportunities to generating disability inclusive data during the pandemic. Now, as we all know, uh, COVID-19 has disrupted life in every corner of the globe. Uh, but while the impact has been far-reaching, the virus and the measures that have been adopted by governments to contain the spread of COVID-19 are hitting the most vulnerable children and family the most. Even before the pandemic struck, we all know that children with disabilities were among the most disadvantaged, facing increased exposure to abuse and, ex and discrimination, as well as reduced access to services in many parts of the world. Now, in the context of the current pandemic, such children may face heightened risk of exposure, complications and that due to underlying conditions and pre-existing vulnerability. For instance, they are at higher risk of contracting the virus because they are more likely to live in congregate care and to be unable to practice prevention measures such as wearing of masks and washing and physical distancing. And as the risk for children with disability have increased due to COVID pandemic, services for these children and their families have been weakened. A recent survey that has been launched by UNICEF uh, through our network of 157 country offices found that over 80% of countries in Eastern Europe and Central Asia reported disruption in access to disability related health services over 80% of countries. At least one quarter of countries reported disruption in social protection systems for persons with disability. In at least half of countries, government failed to adopt measures aimed at facilitating learning for children with disabilities. And equally disturbing was the finding that uh, the participation of civil society organizations uh, that represent persons with disability in uh, government-led responses to the crisis has been very low. Uh, in only about 30% of countries, there has been engagement of civil society organizations in uh, the development and the design and the implementation of mitigating uh, uh, efforts. So now the heightened risk faced by children and adults with disability during the pandemic means that added efforts and inclusive policy responses are required to meet their individual needs. And the increased burden uh, persons with disability share can be reduced if stakeholders take appropriate action for which good quality data are essential. Uh, people have I've mentioned being data geeks. I, I, I'm proud to be part of the uh, data nerds group and really want to underscore the importance of having representative data that are key to enabling countries to transition throughout the various stages of the pandemic and to ensure that nobody is left out in interventions. But having said that, gathering disability inclusive data has been a long-standing challenge in many countries. Even in the absence of a global threat, persons with disability tend to be underidentified, underrepresented, or even excluded altogether from official statistics and monitoring effort. Now, during this pandemic, many of the constraints to producing inclusive data have tightened due to competing urgency, as well as general disruption to data collection protocols. If I just want to take an example, ongoing monitoring efforts, including survey and censuses, have been severely affected. The national statistical offices in many countries have suspended or are adjusting current operations to protect the health and safety of staff and the public. Some of the data collection efforts, for instance, are now being conducted using alternative to in-person interviews. And while these methods can generate important data, persons with disability are still likely to be left out. So to overcome this crisis into an opportunity, we have to make sure that data collection is done by meeting certain fundamental requirements in terms of ethical protocols, 
in terms of data quality standards, but also in terms of inclusiveness. Inclusiveness means many different things. It means, first of all, using deliberate uh, proactive strategy throughout all stages of the data collection process, from the study design to the dissemination of the results. So disaggregation, of course, is fundamental, and this should become a standard practice during the COVID crisis and beyond. But before disaggregation can be accomplished in a meaningful manner, persons with disability will need to be accurately identified throughout the process of data collection. And challenges in this regard, in terms of the identification of persons with disabilities, have been very well documented. Sometimes tools that are based on a very narrow definition of disability have been used in past data collection efforts. In other cases, the sampling methods have done in a way that, uh, the sampling selection has done in a way that excluded persons with disability that, for instance, might be more likely represented uh, among those living in residential care. So all of these elements of tools identification and use of methods might affect the ability of persons with disability to be part of data collection and be represented in numbers. So using the adequate questionnaire, for instance, is fundamental. And the Washington Group tools have been developed in a way that it really address this need for inclusive uh, data collection instruments. UNICEF and the Washington Group, as it's been mentioned, have developed the child function module that really use a broader definition of, of disability and is able to capture uh, the population of children with disability across of, of, of different domains of, uh, of functioning. This instrument has been uh, launched in 2016. And since then, uh, data have been collected using the child functioning module through the multiple indicator cluster survey program mm -hmm. in over 30 countries. So as of now, we already have uh, 30 nationally representative surveys that have been done in low and middle income country and collected information uh, on children with disabilities. And this information on children with disability has been collected with respect to a number of very important indicators of well-being. Uh, in the area of water and sanitation, in the area of education, in the area of protection. Uh, these are some of the different, for instance, areas for which now we are finally able to have data that can be disaggregated for children uh, with and without disability. And in the last minute I have for my intervention, I just wanted to give you a hint of what type of analysis are now possible thanks to this data that have been collected. And here are some examples that are very relevant in the context of COVID-19. We now know, thanks to this data, that compared with children without disabilities, children with disabilities are 57% less likely to have books in their homes. Compared with children without disabilities, children with disabilities are almost twice uh, uh, as more likely to have acute respiratory infections. Children with disability are 32% less likely to read book or be read books at home. And they're also 10% less likely of having soap and water for hand washing in their households. So as you can see with the existing data, even pre-COVID, data, we are able to already unpack some of the vulnerabilities that place children with disabilities at increased risk in the context of the pandemic. The mixed survey are continue to be carried out over the next uh, couple of years. We are going to have 30 more surveys that will be collected. And with this data, UNICEF plan to release a global report on children with disabilities that will be released in March, but we're also launching the creation of a global center of excellence on data for children with disabilities. That will be the opportunity and the, the forum to which we are gonna foster the work, our data work on children with disability. And I wanted to conclude by acknowledging the great support that we have received from a number of different organizations of persons with disability, as well as the Washington Group on Disability Statistics and the government of uh, Australia 
and Norway who have partnered with UNICEF in the support to our data work and the uh, creation of, uh, of the Global Center of Excellence. Thank you very much and I will be happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you very much, Claudia. That was uh, that was excellent, and I can see it's already started some interesting conversations in the in the chat box. So, um, very much appreciated. Thank you, um, Jose. I'm hoping that you're back with us and connected now. Are you able to continue from the three pillars that you were about to outline when, unfortunately, you you disconnected? Yes. Thank you, Dominic. And sorry, um, I will also keep my camera off just to make sure that um, that you can listen um, well. When no it's problem, better. We can hear um, you. Good. So um, the first pillar I was referring to is the need of investing more on equipping OPDs, especially those working at the national level um, around data and persons with disabilities. I think it's key um, that we create the capacities among our organization of persons with disabilities in order for them not only to utilize the available data and to advocate for more data but also to define the different possible roles that OPDs can play in this in this field of data um, how to generate data how community driven data can be used and 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 how the OPDs uh, can contribute to this discussion the second pillar that i think it's critical to consider is that um, the more we partner with um, organizations around the world the more we get support from uh, international organizations in uh, interacting at the national level around data with National Statistics Office and other ministries at the national level, the more opportunities we will have to um, share our views and, 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 and develop our advocacy strategies around data and persons with disabilities. So for me, the second uh, important pillar is how to strengthen uh, this partnership approach where different organizations can uh, help us in opening the doors of ministries and uh, federal agencies around the world for us to um, get engaged uh, and in a meaningful way, of course, in the discussion around data. And the third and last but not least pillar that I would uh, highlight as fundamental is that we know now um, how we can improve the existing uh, excellent tools are, uh, that are available to collect and to and to manage data so i think we need to continue this path of improving um, the available tools um, and how we can improve the use of those tools available and how the organizations and different entities that are leading in the discussion discussion around data can make their studies uh, more inclusive and more accessible um, yesterday i was sharing a side event with representative from the Washington group and, and, and I mentioned the fact that the new website of the Washington group is accessible and um, that we can access to uh, the different tools and the different resources that they have and that is a clear example of how we can improve what is available now. I would like to conclude by once again saying that we all realize that data is key for moving our agenda forward um, it's a matter of how we want to continue working together, recognizing the different uh, components that we have around data and recognizing how we can best contribute to this discussion. We always like to say that a lot of people know a lot about data and we are pleased that they want to work with persons with disabilities and their representative organization. At the same time, we also uh, acknowledge that organization of persons with disabilities we know what matters uh, to persons with disabilities so we want to be in the driving seat in this long journey of promoting persons with disabilities in the field of data thank you dominic Sorry, I've managed to um, mute myself and lose the ability to switch my camera on, so you'll have to uh, manage with, without me. But thanks very much, uh, Jose. Um, uh, now, if I could pass to Teacher Farah. Teacher Farah, over to you, please. Uh, great. Thank you, Dom. Um, so, 
um, thank you for inviting me, first of all, to speak at this session on this important topic. Um, it's been really interesting to hear the insights of my fellow panelists on the work that they are doing on disability inclusive development in their organizations. And I think I particularly liked board's uh, opening comments on the people focus, so emphasizing that point that without the numbers that tell us about people and their situation, it is difficult to take action. So um, the Inclusive Data Charter, which I'm part of, and uh, which is part of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, is a multi-stakeholder initiative working with governments and organizations to advance inclusive and disaggregated data globally to ensure that no one is left behind. So it's an open and growing partnership network which brings together diverse governments and organizations, enabling institutions to advance their commitments and actions on inclusive data and facilitating knowledge exchange and collaboration. So I think others have already touched on uh, the COVID factor that it's really highlighted the importance of inclusive and disaggregated data in order to understand and address the disparities in health and socioeconomic impacts. And that we know of course that persons with disabilities are one of the groups most adversely affected by the pandemic. And I think that also highlights why we need data that's not just focused on disability, but uh, data that looks at how disability intersects with elements such as gender, age, income, and other dimensions to compound inequalities, and then why we need to build that capacity to collect the data. So to build capacity to collect data and then for that data to be used to inform decision making is critical, but we also need to ensure that there's a commitment to collecting the data in the first place. And that's where multi-stakeholder partnerships can add value. So I think this year has really shown the value of partnerships and collaboration in order to take action at scale in terms of COVID-19 response and recovery. And I know Penny highlighted some of the ingredients of successful partnership, including the GLAD Networks experience, and I think Jose's three pillars really resonate with some of the points and examples I'll touch on. So I'll just share some brief examples from the Inclusive Data Charter, which highlight the importance of building capacity to collect and use data and the different ways that partnerships can help us to get there. So the first point was around facilitating engagement between state and non-state actors is important to increase capacity and collective action on inclusive data. So an example of this, the Inclusive Data Charter are working with the Ministry of Labor and Social Social protection in Kenya to identify various data sources available at national level so that they can use that information to identify what needs to be done to make their data more disability inclusive. And an important part of that work we are doing with the ministry is facilitating cross-sectoral collaboration, including engaging the National Statistics Office, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, and others to input into the development of the ministry's inclusive data action plan. And I think that co-creation of the action plan with partners is key to strengthening capacity for collection and use of more inclusive data, as well as overall sustainability. Then the second point is really about making the case for more holistic approaches to ensure that data is drawn from all available sources wherever possible. So one thing we're increasingly seeing is that official data sources alone are not sufficient to provide robust levels of data on how the pandemic has affected different groups. And many civil society organizations have been collecting new data around the impacts of the pandemic, but that is often underutilized. So an example is that the Inclusive Data Charter is currently working alongside a number of other the civil society organizations looking at the possibility of setting up a collaborative because if we can bring together the different types of data that civil society organizations collect we could paint a more holistic picture of the impact of COVID-19 on marginalized groups and also then contribute to efforts to drive forward uh, inclusive and sustainable recovery. And then the final point is around putting people at the center of data, which I think resonates with one of Jose's points. Uh, putting people at the center of that data is critical to ensure that those most affected by the decisions are part of the movement for change. So when data is used by the groups most affected by the policies to advocate for change, it can add weight to the arguments and assist decision makers in understanding the issues and devising solutions. So those are just a few examples on building the capacity to collect and use data. And I think to conclude, I will just say that we are seeing an increased level of awareness, of course, on the need for more inclusive data, but there's a lot more still to do. 
And for COVID-19 recovery efforts to be inclusive, we need to better understand the intersecting forms of discrimination faced by persons with disabilities through collecting and using disability inclusive data. And partnerships can help to facilitate that multi-sectoral knowledge exchange to better understand the barriers and challenges to inclusive data, to learn from each other on what works and what doesn't. Then we can think about more in-depth capacity building and collaborations that can help us to bring new opportunities to collectively take action to ensure that more inclusive data is collected and used so that no one is left behind. So uh, I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Farr, and I'm, I'm really pleased you managed to get in the, the, the value and the importance of intersectionality when we look at disaggregated data. I think that's a really critical point. Thank you. Um, Alberto, can I pass to you, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be in this panel. Uh, as you may know, the last report of the former Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina de Bandas, was on disability inclusive international cooperation. And the report discusses the importance of international cooperation to support the rights of people with disabilities, but also provides guidance on how to ensure disability inclusive international cooperation. For the preparation of the report, we analyzed 40 responses to a questionnaire sent to states, national human rights institutions, and civil society, as well as uh, relevant publications and literature. We also commissioned a study led by Valerie Carr, which included surveys and interviews with 26 bilateral and multilateral agencies and 10 private donors. I would say that the main takeaway from the report is that since the adoption of the CRPD, there has been a, an increase in the attention paid by the international cooperation community to the rights of people with disabilities. However, in few, with few exceptions, I think this increase of awareness has not resulted in much more resources allocated to disability inclusive or disability specific projects. So yes, more attention, but still not more money. Um, there are some areas in which there has been more advances, policy development and strategies, participation, evaluation, capacity building. There is a significant room for improvement there, but states and, are don and donors are moving in the right direction. The report also noticed and, and welcomes the, the partnerships created to promote disability inclusion in the development and humanitarian agendas. This includes for, for sure the UNPRPD, the GLAD Network, and the Global Disability Summit. For example, the evaluation conducted by Valerie Carr noted that the GLAD Network and the Disability Summit strongly influenced donors to develop new policies and strategy for disability inclusive development. So very welcome development. Um, nevertheless, as I mentioned earlier, there is still a significant gap in relation to programming and resource allocation. We don't have comprehensive data, but the evidence collected from the report suggests that disability programs are significantly underfunded with less than 1% of donor funding. And this finding is in line with a similar uh, uh, exercise done this year by development initiatives, uh, which stated that eight projects targeting persons with disabilities represented less than 2% of all international aid between 2014 and 2018. And when they limited their search to disability inclusions, a project represented less than 0.5%. And, and I think you may be aware that a recent report of Inclusion International also shows that some marginalized groups within the disability community, as those with intellectual disabilities, have even less chances to benefit from international aid. Indeed, a third of all projects that they mapped that included people with intellectual disabilities in 2018 a third were contrary to the CRPD, and few projects were actually managed by DPOs. So what can be done, and then I won't get in, into all the recommendations of the report, but I would like to stress a couple that are key. The first one is the classic mainstream, mainstream, mainstream. So we need disability inclusion in, integrated into the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of all mainstream policies and programs. But this needs to be complemented with disability-specific policies and programs in international aid. 
Um, and this is for sure particularly relevant in the context of this pandemic, because as we know, people with disabilities need to be included in all COVID-19 related efforts. The second recommendation is another oldie but a goodie, ensuring a human rights based approach to disability and international cooperation should promote inclusion, not segregation, we know. So clear commitments are needed to stop financing institutions or segregated education, for example, and more participation of people with disabilities and their organizations is needed in decision making, as well as direct partners. Uh, I think we, we need to break this, this logic of the beneficiary and, and to, to start building more direct partnerships. And finally, a, a clear recommendation from the report is we need to better measure, monitor, and monitor resource mobilization for disability inclusion. The report recommends adopting and systematically using the disability marker of the OACD was mentioned by Penny. We need to make it universal, um, but also I, uh, the report recommends considering targets for disability specific funding, which all donors could progressively work to achieve within their overall funding portfolios. And to be and, and, and to add to the issue of data desegregation, data desegregation by disability is also needed to measure if projects or programs are reaching people with disabilities. Just to finalize, the COVID pandemic is pushing donors and agencies to revisit their strategies and portfolio for the next year and the following years. Let's, I, let's make it an opportunity for the inclusion of people with disabilities. Thank you so much, Alberto. Thank you. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass straight on to our final panelist, uh, Susan Scott Parker. Please go ahead, Susan. And I have five minutes. I know, Don. Hello, everyone. I wanted to start by saying that there has never been a better time, a better moment to put partnership with business high on GLAD's, on GLAD's agenda and to craft a systematic structured approach to ensuring that any and all business partnerships deliver maximum value. I see two aims, really. One is to leverage the power and influence of business behind the economic and social inclusion of persons with disabilities as colleagues, potential colleagues, customers, suppliers, fellow citizens, and to positioning it throughout as a business and human rights priority. And secondly, building on the mainstream theme, leverage the influence of business to position disability inclusive development as a priority for the mainstream public private sector partnerships now tackling inequality youth employment the digital skills gap job creation and those that will doubtless emerge to drive the post-covid rebuild so in order to do this we must position business as a valued stakeholder as a valued service user as a valued potential partner and ally which means we must invest the time and energy in getting to, to know the world of business, to understand their world, their reality, and to bridging the gap between the sectors, to overcome what I would describe as a failure at, at a very basic level, just to communicate. This also means that from the start, we must consciously enable the personal relationships uh, between the humans with disabilities and the humans working in the private sector, the relationships that make productive and sustainable partnership possible. And we must be open to also learning from business and to learning from business-led initiatives. I'm struck by GIZ's strategy, which Vern calls simply learning from the best in business. Given I've only got now four minutes, I have a few suggestions, questions, just to offer in a kind of bullet format. My focus here really is probably more on economic empowerment than other issues, but I'm very conscious that members are working with business across a very wide range of their organizational objectives. So thinking about the network, how can GLAD make it easier for members to articulate the business and ethical rationale for disability inclusive partnerships with business? Here's where the data really counts. I wonder if we might share some of the work that GIZ has been doing in this domain. What would make it easier for GLAD members to persuade their colleagues working in those mainstream public private sector partnerships to actually put disability on the agenda and to work with their business partners to generate innovative solutions. How could funders get better outcomes from the economic empowerment programs they fund 
because they explicitly build the capacity of their providers to deliver the services and supports that meet the needs and expectations of business in the language business understands as valued service users. It was brilliant to see FCDO investing in the employer toolkit, which precisely because it makes it easier for business to say yes to best practice, makes it easier for job seekers with disabilities. How can we routinely share the case studies, the stories, the examples, as members design innovative partnerships with business? I mean, if you look at GIZ investing in the business disability network starting up in India, and I think also in Kenya, we're looking at HR professionals from the private sector, working in partnership with the Inclusion Works Consortium, acting as mentors, helping persons with disabilities to find meaningful jobs and careers through their expertise as HR people working in the private sector. Or we've got the example of East Africa breweries bringing farmers with disabilities into their commercial supply chain, supported again by Inclusion Works, funded, of course, by, I have to say, DFID. I have yet to get the new name in my head. So how can we leverage what responsible business leaders are already doing? And I think this is crucial. When we look at what responsible business leaders are doing, starting with the Valuable 500, with the ILO's Global Business Disability Network, with the Purple Light Up movement, how do we enable the culture change that triggers a new conversation with these companies that starts with, how can we make it easier together for you to deliver on your board level commitment to the ILO, to the Valuable 500, to, to Purple Light Up? And finally, how might GLAD trigger the new conversations with business at global and regional level that in turn start to open up so many partnership opportunities at the national? And I wanted to finish really just by saying, I'm wondering if members would be interested in having a webinar designed to let members swap notes and learning the ideas they've got regarding different models of partnership with business, what they're finding business disability partnerships can deliver, and of course, how to design partnerships with business that really work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. Thank you. Um, I, I'm afraid I've singularly failed to uh, to get us through in time to be able to um, tackle some of the questions that have come up, but, um, but I and others have been debating in the chat box. So I, I think you should be able to find some of the answers, at least to some of the questions that have been raised in the chat box, if you take a scroll through. Um, and there's various materials and uh, websites and, and references being shared there. So I hope you find that a useful resource. Um, it only remains uh, for me to thank uh, everyone for both your questions and the communication in the chat box. And of course, to the panelists and the keynote speakers for all that you've shared with us today. I'd also really like to thank Emanuela Pham and Yetna Bergstagusi uh, for all of your work behind the scenes um, on the event. Um, for me, GLAD is a really remarkable network of all those driving disability inclusion and the CRPD into global development thinking and practice. Um, this session, I think, has been a really clear example of the network's ability to convene and to share experiences and, and learning. Um, data, as we've heard from many of the speakers, is uh, well, from all of the speakers, is a uh, is a really critical part of the solution to the problem of exclusion. And put simply, if people are not counted, they often do not count. This isn't acceptable in 2020 any more than it was in the last century, and we simply must do better. Um, I'm hopeful that the work that has been shared today, that's currently being done, um, has put us on that path to a truly inclusive world. So thank you all for attending. I'm very sorry we didn't get time to deal with all of the questions and answers, but, um, but I hope you've been able to pick up some from the chat, as I say. Um, I, uh, I want to wish you all and your loved ones to stay safe and stay healthy um, and goodbye from us. Thank you. <laughs>